Bonjour, vous écoutez MLOps Podcast, c'est le meilleur podcast du monde. Mon nom est Julien et je voudrais vous parler aujourd'hui de, pro pro de problèmes techniques pour gens heureux. How's your French coming along, Vishnu? Just like my Spanish, it is stunted, terrible, I don't understand anything, beyond maybe bonjour. That's it, that's all I got. What about you? Oh, are, nice. you are you fluent in French? Oh no, not even close, but I, I understand a few words. Just from, I, like I tell most people, I mean, Julien, our guest today, is not from France. He's from Belgium, just as a little bit of a sanity <laughs> check. But important. I've lived on, <laughs> yeah, totally. I don't think he would like it if we confuse the two. But I lived on both yes. sides of France enough mm -hmm. to pick up a few words in French. Uh, currently living in Germany, and before this, I was living in Spain. So I can say, you know, the basics to get me by and get myself a croissant. Anyway... It was cool, man. I really enjoyed this conversation. What'd you think? It was great. Julian is an infrastructure engineer extraordinaire. He's been at a number of different companies. Most recently is at Spotify and perhaps has another adventure left in him. And his focus is on enabling technologies like Kubernetes in an ML context to help scale intensive data and ML related jobs. So really fascinating technical background, but he shared a lot of different nuggets. What was your favorite, Demetrios? Dude, I loved when he talked about from the beginning, it was almost like from the get go, he was on fire and he, he touched on what we always say here, but it cannot be repeated enough on like the technology problems are easy. The people problems are the difficult ones, the processes are so much more intricate and detailed than the actual tech. And then there was the whole, his views on chaos engineering in the context of machine learning was awesome. So keep your ears ready for that one when you get the chance and perk up if you hear it. Uh, but what about you? What were some key takeaways that you had? Yeah, I mean, I think for me, there were two takeaways that are really crucial to being a sort of machine learning or data engineer. Uh, at this moment in time. And, and number one, I would say, is his point around how to manage your career. It's easy for uh, engineers to focus on what technologies they know, but he offered some great suggestions on how to think about it in a bigger way around what problems you're trying to solve. So I really suggest listening to that. And the second piece was what chaos engineering is and how that mindset, which he goes through, is actually really useful in the context of highly complex modern production ML system. So a lot to learn from what he was talking about. Any closing words, Demetrios? Yeah, I just want to give a huge shout out to our sponsor, Supervise. Yesterday or two days ago, they released their SaaS version of the product. So if anyone wants to just go play around with a monitoring tool for machine learning, you can check that out in the links below. That being said, let's talk to the man himself, Julian Bisconti. Oh, I hope I said that right. But Bisconti, you know, I'm professional at butchering names. So here we go. Let's talk to Julian. Julian, we were just having a great conversation about the two kinds of people that we tend to have on our podcast here. And I think our listeners will be very familiar with this, where they're sort of more product and organizational folks who tend to talk about the organizational challenges of MLOps. And then there are also the more implementation and technically oriented professionals who talk about the how challenges of MLOps. You told us that you were both, and I'm really excited to get into that. But tell me about what you're so passionate about on the non-technical side that I think that everyone else should hear. You were telling us about process and, and why that's so important. How well, did definitely. you arrive at that? Well, um... Basically, when I was a software engineer, I transitioned towards site reliability engineering. So I, I focused on the reliability, the the cost. This mainly has to do with cloud and resources and providing like a platform to developer and helping them with the code to featuring uh, observability, like metrics, uh, you know, logs, tracing, and those kind of things. And I would say I envy people who have technical problems because I would say that most problems are, are truly organizational first. And I would say that it's much harder to change a process than it is to change code. 
um, for the simple reason that wow. making people understand the context of why we do things is actually very hard. And you, human don't have a high bandwidth communication. Like the speech, text, uh, even video is actually really low bandwidth. When, especially now that everybody's working remotely, we, we can feel mm. that. Face to face is a little bit better, but uh, you know it, it's it's very hard to explain to people sometimes why they should or should not do go a certain way, and what are the pros and cons and the trade off, and how far it is. And I think that data is actually what helps a lot with this. Like company that makes data driven decision have a much better, a much faster decision process. You know they they make decision faster and more decision on a given time. And that helps them to actually increase speed. And for company, I, I don't think I've found another metric that uh, defines success other than speed. speed well, there execution. was something you mentioned right before we hit record, and I wanted to just go into this a little bit more, was how you envy people with technological problems. Can you yes. say that again and why that is? Well, because basically everything has been solved, uh, at, at least from, from my point of view, you know, it's not like maybe we need a more performant algorithm. Maybe we need a little bit more confused, a little bit more time or money, but uh, th those problems are, are, are solved already. And it's, it comes from the fact that if you don't know something, maybe it's good to learn from someone who already solved that problem. It, it's hard to find those people, but they exist. Uh, and sometimes it can be from the same discipline or cross discipline. And I, I take that from the site reliability engineering part, which is basically how do you deal with an incident? Well, airlines have had to deal with that in a very serious level, like it's people's lives. So, so they, they, we can actually learn from other domain, from domain other than tech, basically. Tech is everywhere these days, but the, the domain they are in has also some really nugget of wisdom that we can use. And, and, and so, so the, yeah, the, the main thing there, I, if I'm understanding it correctly, it's like for you, the technological part has been solved. And it, that's where you're like, the hard part is the people and the processes. And you mentioned it's, it's much easier to change a piece of tech out than it is to change out a process when you have people asking why and you have this low bandwidth conversation. Definitely. And I'm going to give you a best example. We, we talk about machine learning platform, right? Do, do you know how long it takes to build a platform from scratch? And, and just that, like, think about it. It's two years, basically. You, you, you're in for, for a journey, given that you already know what you're doing. So th that's not a given, you know, P people who build machine learning platform are not like, uh, it, right. they are kind of rare. Uh, actually, they're probably listening to this podcast. So hello, everybody. <laughs> nice to meet you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> the, the, the thing is that, uh, and I, I, I was telling that w when the time the, the cloud came around. So it was uh, 2015 and people were comparing VM to VM, the cost of, you know, the cloud to a cost of the VM or of a server that you can buy. And then they forget that they actually have to build that data center and then they have to connect it to the internet. Uh, but to connect it to the internet, you have to go to a telecom provider, which is usually a monopoly. And they, they, they just overcharge you premium for the bandwidth that you get. And so you, you add all those little costs and you, you get the total cost of ownership. And this is something that people don't compare often because it's more like an art than a science. Like how do you really measure, um, you know, the time it takes to build a data center rather than to run it? You understand? And those have different, um, you know, consequences for the the operation cost and the accounting and all those things. But people don't realize that if you need something now, the cloud is actually a really good option. And mm. even if you scale, it's it's still, uh, I, I don't know if you, if you heard the story, but uh, Uber had, uh, had a too, too high cost of uh, observability. So the, the, the storage and the querying of the metrics were just prohibitive. And the percentage right. that they were making 
is it was just too high compared to how, how much the total cost. So they, they created their own database. I'm not sure if you understand what kind of position you have to be in to say, you know what, today yeah. I'm going to write, I'm going to create a new database and it's going to be awesome. And, and I mean, there is, I don't think there is a harder problem than create a database that is efficient to store and query. I mean, compilers yeah. are hard, but databases are, are just as hard. And, and so you see, this is, this is kind of like the, where I want to, to talk about, because when you start building an ML platform, you start from nothing. And let's say that two years later, you have your platform. But during those two years, the cloud didn't froze. It, it, mm. it, it still evolved. And so you, suddenly you find out that you stuck with your platform that is going to be really hard because you, you had to learn and find the right level of abstraction for your APIs and teach people and train them and put on call and all that um, total cost of ownership actually has such a toll on the organization and i find so, that in please yeah i i think that's a really interesting way that you phrase this because we talk about this a lot in terms of the build versus buy context right now the build versus buy is often a trite oversimplification because that's the way that you have to pre present it to your managers Right. But the reality is, is when you're an engineer or when you're a working professional charged with developing ML products, there's a lot of different sort of like atomic decisions that you make in terms of adoption or decision to build it yourself. Right. And what you're saying is, if I am starting to do that uh, sort of building myself earlier in the journey, I'm essentially missing out on the advances of other cloud providers. Is that what you've seen over the past few years from the companies that you've worked with, that those that have chosen to do it themselves have basically missed out on crucial innovations in the cloud sphere? There are exceptions. I know a few exceptions and those people have hired such a such a brilliant team. I mean, those people, it's the people that are not in conference, they don't talk about, but they are wizard when it comes right. to, to, to a computer. And this is basically the the level that you need to, to, to build a proficient platform. I mean, you know, they, they often say you're, you're not Google, but you, you understand like Google build platforms and that leads to, uh, I mean, they, they use their own platform. But the thing is that if you're in a big organization, whether it's someone in another business unit or in the cloud is almost the same level of communication. It, it's still like, you know, you probably don't talk to them directly. And, and so it, it, there is an exception to everything I say, you know, I'm not saying like, yeah. this is the way and that's the gospel and please uh, let's join hand and sing Kumbaya around the fire. It's really not that. <laughs> it's, it, it's really like- I would love that you, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you would play guitar around the fire and we would have exactly. a M MLOps campfire. I, I would join. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you, you know, it's very, it's, it's just hard. It's just hard so, to build a platform. It's a great, it's a great point you just made, which is, you know, when I think about building a business, which is what we all do, whether you're at a big, big company or a small company, you're building a business, right? There are a couple of different resource pools that you're trying to draw from and try to build a business with. And the reality is, is that to do the kinds of things in terms of ML platform, requires drawing from a very deep and very specific talent pool that not every company can realistically put the effort and money into hiring. And your point is that some of these companies that have done it successfully that we look to as examples of our platforms, right? They have hired from pools of talent that are simply not accessible to everyone else. And I think that that's a, that's a journey that I have seen myself having been at multiple startups is making frank realizations in terms of like, who are the people that we're trying to put together to build the business that we can and where can we realistically draw from? Now, with that said, I have an honest question. Every engineer is sitting in their office, home office, wherever they are thinking, hey, I could like use this online, this tool that exists for this problem already, or I could figure out the problem from first principles and then have that on my resume and learn a lot more. And in the long run for my career, that may be better for me to say, oh, I have this understanding of like these things I've built rather than these accelerants that other people will sort of ridicule and say, oh, well, he doesn't, he or she, or they don't actually know from first principles, the problem that they're trying to solve. 
hence the temptation to build your own database so that you can write a blog post about it. You've had a successful technology career. What's your advice to me and that developer that's thinking, hey, should I build it or buy it for my own career potential? Well, there are many ways to increase you know, your value on the mar hiring market. And I think like having a, tech, a high tech resume is just one of them. I would say if you have to you know, um, invest in something, it's more like take a class on negotiation skills because that's basically your salary. <laughs> no, but it's true. It's like the, the, it's the, true, it's a great point. It's just a few hours and you're going to be briefed and trained. And, and the next time you are in front of a recruiter, this is where, you know, all the tricks space. It's the highest return on investment you can have. So it has nothing to do with technology. Um, I would say like teaching has, has had the greatest impact on my life professionally and personally. Like uh, when I arrived uh, four years ago in Sweden, I basically know, don't, didn't know anyone. And it's through meetups and the local community by uh, giving talks that I made a lot of friends there. And it, it created a, a, a great network. I, I still keep in touch with pe those people today. Uh, so I would say you, you can be the best of the best. And then suddenly you, you're going to be in one company and never write a blog post about that. And I'm not sure that building a database is is even considerate. You know, like how good is going to sure. be? Yeah. Uh, you, you know, like I, I, you have tons of stories of people trying an open, starting an open source project, and then you know going down in flames and crying <laughs> because it's just so hard uh, right. and to maintain and to to build and to you know review issues. And, and honestly, yeah, if you want to write code, please do enjoy it. Uh, does it have to run in production with a thousand other people hammering on it? That's another problem. Um, if you want to get good, there, there's many ways to, to do, but what are you optimizing for? What, what do you want out of your career? What, what, I, what I, would you... you go ahead, go ahead. No, it's like, what, what would make you proud? What would make you look in the mirror and say, yes, mm -hmm. you know, I'm, yeah. I'm really happy with myself. I, I'm proud of what I did or... And for me, it was really to help other people. So I started teaching. Um, I, 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 I get a lot more by helping others than actually having some really fancy skills on my resume because those, you know, and there's also this concept that uh, if you have a certification or something like that, it's just one indicator. But usually mm -hmm. if you're at the cutting edge, there, there is not even a blog post about it. The, yeah. If there is a book yeah. about a topic, you're already too late. You understand? If there, if there <laughs> yeah. is somebody who can teach you about that, you, you, you're point. lucky. Uh, and, and so this is where I, I feel like um, even those cutting edge problems are kind of a combination of all problems put together. Uh, it, it was a, a very, very uh, experienced consultant once told me, it's like every problem can be broken down into simple Unix command. And <laughs> the, the, since, it took, since it told me that, I could not unsee it. You know, it, it's, it is so <laughs> true. It's so, I, true. I, I, it's so true. Yo, Vishnu, real quick. Do you like getting new jobs? I love getting new jobs and I love looking at benefits packages because it's the <laughs> best part of starting a new job. Do you like jobs? Let's talk about some jobs that we got in the community right now. Walmart Labs has, they're looking for a director of data science. We've got Zen ML looking for a developer advocate role. What else do we got? We got StockX looking for a senior applied scientist role focused on machine learning. I really endorse taking a look at this job. Sam and Ray, who are both community members, are hiring for this job at StockX. And by the way, if you want to check out more jobs, check out our MLOps palette. You can find it in the jobs channel or go to mlops.palette.com slash jobs. For me, there's something interesting that you're talking about there too. And this comes from, I was speaking a few days ago with my friend, Henry, who works at LaunchDarkly, and he does not have anything to do with machine learning, but he's a backend engineer. And he was talking to me about these little hacks that he's found along the way when it comes to growing in your career and uh, along your path. And one was he was talking about how important it is to document things and just how he's seen over time that the people that really excel in their careers are the ones that are they're voracious documenters. And the whole reason behind that, and I've said it before, but it re bears repeating, 
it is if you can, as one engineer, affect the way that 10 engineers work, it's going to be a lot more powerful than you doing 10 engineers work, no matter what. Like that is just going to give you infinitely more leverage. And so that was one. And so I asked him, all right, what's more? What are some other good hacks that you've heard about? And this is what I was thinking about to your question, Vishnu. It was like, he said, you know, a lot of times people don't realize how powerful it can be for a company to just, and for someone, some individual contributor to take the bull by the horns and onboard a SaaS product. And most of the time it is so easy to just, grab a product off the shelf, incorporate it into your company, and you don't need, for a lot of these products that are out right now, it's not like you need to go through procurement. You don't need to do much. You just take that like Brex card that you have for your startup, you pay for it, and then you go. And so that was a huge one that I felt like, oh, I, I never realized that. But because if you do that, you are affecting the way that the company works and you're able to, even if you're able to just shave like 1% off of each engineer's time that they spend in repetitively doing things, you have made a significant impact in the business. And so we can bring this back to the machine learning aspect and talk about that. But what I really want to talk about uh, with you, Julian, is the idea of chaos engineering because that's something that, for me is fascinating and I would love to hear how you look at chaos engineering when it comes to machine learning. Yeah, sure. Um, actually chaos engineering has had a big impact uh, on me, especially because of those cross domain, um, problems that were solved independently and they kind of all come together. I would say this is a mentality shift. So, so inside reliability engineering, we have the concept what we call service level objective. So it, it's basically you, you set up um, a statistics on what you find acceptable on your service. Let's say I want all the requests to answer below 100 milliseconds, you know, for over a period of time. And this creates uh, what we call a budget. So when you are actually above that number, you can say, I have some budget, I have a uh, wiggle room to actually break things. And this translates is what we call an error budget. This budget is called the error budget. That budget, you can spend it on doing chaos experiment. But cha chaos is a very misleading name. Actually, we, we don't add chaos to the, the system. We reveal the chaos that is already inside the system. So let me, let me give you an example. So when you, you scale, right? If you have like 3 VM, you go from 3 VM to 5. Uh, you create, then you find out that the load is going down so you can scale down. How do you know which, which machine is gonna get killed first? And this is basically the kind of question you have, how do you find the answer? And so the, the, the experiment that you can run is state your hypothesis that the, the newly created one are killed first. And then you test it. And it's a very scientific approach. It's not at all like, a, hey, let's break production. <laughs> they say like some people have done chaos engineering, you know, inadvertently. But uh, it's not at all. It's a, the, the chaos part is actually quite small. There is all the, the analysis part that comes after and getting the data. And the prerequisite to chaos engineering is actually have stellar monitoring. Because if you don't know mm. what, what's happening, uh, well, you, you just know you broke things and that's, that's, that's the result. And sometimes to confirm an hypothesis, it gets, it, you, 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 you find questions you didn't have before because suddenly you understand how the system works and you understand the edge case of the system. And it could be like so many things. I, I had things that nobody could have figured out until we hit some problem and scaling is one of them. Usually, you know, if if you have a database and suddenly the num number of backend just scale up, at some point you might um, the number of connection to the database might be too much that you start dropping, and the the database is still accessible, but just some some backend cannot access it, 
And so you have that and say, how, how can we improve on that? And say, well, okay, we, you, there is some numbers, you can find you those things. And this, this chaos engineering gives you such a confidence into the system that you know you can break it. And, and so you, you confidence to the point like, you know, you know exactly how long it would take if a, a, a whole region gone bust, how long it would take to recreate it into a different region. And sometimes, uh, you know, we talk about infrastructure as code and things like that, but I find that, you know, it, sometimes the simplest solution scales, scales best. And I, yes. uh, you know, implementing infrastructure as code has a lot of uh, trick. And the problem is if you automate something that you use once every six months, I'm pretty sure you're going to have to relearn everything you need the moment you, have, you need to use it because you don't remember how is it automated. And, yeah. and sometimes having the, those run books helps a lot. And if it is like going to the UI of the cloud and creating a cluster manually and then triggering the, the, the CICD pipeline to rede redeploy everything there is your, is your fix. That's an acceptable fix in my opinion because you spend very little time you know, preparing for it and the problem is solved. So it's all about risk, right? It's like how, how much do you, how much reliability do you need? Uh, how, how much usability uh, are you going to have when your user are, are, you know, when there is a problem? And it all comes down to, to cost, basically. Everything, tra money translates to everything. Yeah. I, I can tell you like this. Uh, I want to ask a quick question here before you, before you jump into that. This is, you know, the first time I'm really hearing uh, in, a, in a clear fashion what chaos engineering is. And I, and I liked your dis distillation of it a lot. As I hear it, I am reminded of how entropic or chaotic machine learning systems are, right? You have the data, which is constantly changing. You have the model, and especially with the advent of deep learning models, we have, to put it politely, some unpredictable models with a lot of different factors involved. And then you have the code itself, which involves a lot of different components because of how challenging it can be to code and configure machine learning systems. In the context of all of that, what is the role of chaos engineering in building production machine learning systems? Oh, it's uh, very interesting because I, I had this question recently and it, it, it bec the solution became very complicated very quickly in the sense that, let's say you, you have a model that is behaving badly in production. Uh, what do you do? Do you fall? Do you fall back to the previous version? Do you still have it? Is it easy to deploy, or do you fall back to a heuristic like a, some some backend? And funny thing enough, like many people think that MLOps is kind of you, you take a DevOps engineer and you put it doing MLOps and it's going to go fine. But the problem that MLOps has is so it's kind of the same but a different scale because we don't deal with code; we deal with data. And yeah. you know all the tool, all the tooling that we have is built for code, meaning like a few megabyte, as opposed to MLOps, which is like terabyte, sometimes petabyte. So, so the order of magnitude, you cannot create something that scale more than a hundred times of the, the scale it was meant meant to fix, basically. And so, the, the, these uh, load balancer, for instance, they are not meant to, you know or if, uh, you know, to implement that use case. They, they just either keep retrying, but they, they, they fall back onto something that, uh, like th this concept is, is actually quite hard to implement in any load balancer because they are not meant to be automated in that way. They don't say if this one fail, just trigger the redeploy of the previous model. So at the end, you have two, two model in production and imagine on the, on the monitoring, what does that do? How do you differentiate which model got used? And so you see, it's those little little details that in the grand scheme of things make like things so complicated. And that's why changing the process of how people do things is is really the one thing that um, is, is gonna define the success because they need to very quickly change how they do things in order to map whatever the business need. And so the, the you know, uh, I, I heard, I think it was in the podcast, I don't remember which is, but it's like a, that uh, uh, ML engineer should be able to ship things to production. And I have to say, it really depends what you want them to, to focus on. If it's the ML part or actually the MLOps part, 
because the, as soon as you get like people who know both machine learning and operation, they're pretty rare. You understand? It, it's like a, yeah. not a big pool of people. And I mean, if you think about it, it takes five years to get a master's degree in computer science. So, you know, you, you don't have to wait five years for hiring a new person or, you know, I, I take five years, I take a degree as an example, but it takes time for people to learn those things. Uh, I, I had data scientists coming to me and say like, what's Docker? And I was like, are you kidding? I, I was like, I had such a, you know, I had to really find empathy in me to understand like, okay, let's do a workshop. I'm going to teach you everything you need to do. And it got me thinking like, should they really be focusing on that? Like, is that really what I, what they want to do with their life? You know, right. if, if I'm a data scientist and suddenly I'm a glorified sysadmin doing, uh, you know, Ubuntu <laughs> debugging with GPU and drivers and all those things. It's like, why? why? They, they should hate themselves. Like, I would yeah, hate myself if right. it was my job. <laughs> you understand? And so this is where the, the, pla the, the platform is interesting because... Yeah. You, you need to provide the right level of abstraction to the user to find that it's, it's, a, it's a hit and miss. You, you have to try, you have to talk, you have to iterate, you have to have a good organization, a safe mm -hmm. organization, an inclusive yes. organization, because people come from different backgrounds and they have different knowledge. And, and so this is why the you know, Spotify model is, is quite, uh, I mean, in Sweden, it's not really proper to Spotify, but in Sweden, uh, companies have a very safe um, psychological safety, meaning mm -hmm. that it's it's okay to to discuss something without you know throwing chair at each other or you know it's a they're very open to dialogue and and that facilitates a lot of things. I would say it's it's one of the best way to to deal with that. There's so much to unpack in what you just said. And I want to start first by saying, um, you're probably one of the funniest guests we've had in a while. <laughs> I'm over here cracking up, so this is awesome. <laughs> Number two, I think your comment about having empathy and understanding, you know, how people fit together is so crucial because I do think companies and teams that are working on engineering tend to be lazy about people and not technology. And that's weird to me because people is much, people are much harder to hire and find and pay and compensate and keep, right? But when we hire someone, we don't think, oh, well, how am I, you know, no manager is sitting there and saying, what is my 90 day plan to upskill this person to the point where they're productive? They're saying, okay, new hire, you're getting hired, go, now learn. And it's like, to me, that's so, it's so ass backwards, right? It's like, come on, but, I digress from my main question, which to you is, you have very succinctly put what the core challenge of sort of ML ops is, which is we need to configure the data, not just the code. How have you solved this problem in previous technical environments, given the tools that you've had? Can you tell us a little bit either about your experience at Embark or Spotify, great companies? How have you practically solved this problem? Maybe through an example of a model or a system that you were trying to help productionize? This is where I tell you, use the cloud. <laughs> I, I, would, okay. I say if you have something to do, uh, it is going to save you hours and hours, days, if not. And it's easier like because once you figure out your use case, your level of abstraction, it's easier to build it when you already know what it looks like. And, and, and um, this is the hard part because it's like you try to learn, a, uh, let's say you, you want to learn about finance, but you're learning in Spanish. If you don't speak Spanish, it's going to be twice as hard. Here, you would already understand, you know, what layer of abstraction you're working on and what your, your people can, can manage. And then you can recreate it yourself. Most of the time, I would say there is not a lot that is uh, readily available or packaged. And so you have to find those tricks and those tricks can be like with the, the, the file name of the, of the file in the bucket, uh, as you know, you, you can find some dirty tricks, having some kind of, you know, super efficient database like spanner that will solve most of your scaling pro scalability problem. And yeah, you, you pay for it, but 
I would say when you count the cost of how long it's going to take, how much resources, and all those people are going to build something that they could get from a credit card, and they cannot focus on actually making building the feature. And for a startup, it sounds, I mean, I would be very surprised if a startup come to me and say, you know what, we really need to beat our, build our own ML platform because it's like if today, I mean, not, not two years ago, but today. Because now it's it's like uh, there, there's so many options that they could find, and I would say that even though they should first ask the question like is really ML what you know the the real solution can can you do something that does half the job you know handle fifty percent of the use case in something that you already with something that you already know, and I, I would say that consistency is key here. So I, I'm going to tell you a little bit of story. It's af, uh, uh, after the Second World War, the U.S. Army has made uh, studies on, you know, airplanes, like what, why they fail, what, what, why, what kind of error the pilots were making. And they find out, you know, that 50% of the error was called um, substitution error, meaning that when the pilot go into the plane, the, the, the dashboard of the plane, the plane were different. So the, the way the altitude and, uh, you know, the, the button, the controls were different. And that caused, you know, half of the mistake. They standardized the dashboard and overnight, half of the mistake were gone. They didn't standardize the plane though, you know, it's just the way, the interface from the human to the machine, they standardized that. And it, think about it, how we, we build our tools. And so if you have like in, in your startup, you have one language, one platform, one API, you know, like the, those things that you, you already know where to look. And then when you start feeling the pain, just, you know, like, like an organism, like a cell that divides in two, you, you just branch out. And so this Wait. is a little bit how the, the concept of evolving into something starts simple because simple scales. So you're you're talking about standard this idea of standardization has come up quite a bit and i know that i've heard it talked about where it's standardizing on an industry level but you're saying just standardize within the company so that everyone in the company understands how things work at this company and it will be much easier and there will be less mistakes made yes Definitely. Otherwise, you know, it's more like, oh, there is this open source project. Oh, there is that open source. And they kind of overlap. And in the end, everything is installed and you don't really know what to use. And you're going to spend more time asking around what should I use? Is What is good to use? What is maintained? It's like, oh, we forgot to undeploy that, uh, you know, those kind of things. It, it's, And that's the problem with, you know, dealing with computers is that we don't see what's going on unless you know the, the keystroke to actually, that will actually get you there. And so working early on on things like security, like, or let me rephrase, working early on on IAM management is actually really important because half of the error I see is more like, hey, I don't have access to this and I don't understand why. Of course, they're not gonna tell you, oh, you don't, this is the place you should go if you don't have access. Like that's kind of a security breach, right? If, if it's an attacker, it would be so happy to see that, but. <laughs> yeah. they, they, and this is the this is the hard things about hard things is that is the thing that we don't see. Mm -hmm. uh, it's everything like uh, backups, you know, reliability is the things we don't see. Monitoring it sounds so easy, but I see people uh, logging so much at some point. I, I I rename a service blowhole because that's all I I could understand it was doing is just like pouring data over things and the cost of data storing those logs was getting more than running the service. And I'm like, you know what? You have to choose. Either you do distributed system or you do logging. Which one do you want? Because for every system that you get, like one request, go through all the services, it's every time one log entry that gets added. In the end, it's just an exponential explosion of you know data that is actually completely useless because it's stack trace and they use it for debugging. And this is where I advise, like, if you're building a distributed system, use tracing because tracing is built to actually efficiently store those data. And this is where, you know, it sounds like uh, crazy to say don't log, but I, I worked at companies where I was not allowed to log 
unless it was an unrecoverable, uh, unrecoverable error. Like if you if all else fails, you can log because it costs too much to to log. So there wow. is all those tricks that you learn when once you start, you know, moving from one scale to another. It's actually the same problem, but a d different scale, which makes it another problem. It's like, it's the same problem, but a little bit different. And so that, that's where, you know, you, you have problems that you never had before. You thought like, yeah, I, I just use a database. And then you realize you have two terabytes in that database. That's not gonna, you know, queries are getting slow and, and those things. And so it's still a database, but you need a different database that can handle that kind of thing. And, and, so and those problems are very, very complicated. There is something that I wanted to get into because you mentioned like, okay, in the beginning or just if you're a startup and you're looking to go into these things, just use the cloud, especially because it will give you that standardized, easy way to go from zero to one. And I've heard that said before, I, I can buy into it. And now where I'm at though is how do you reconcile the trade-offs that you get where you use a Vertex or the SageMaker and it gets you kind of what you're looking for, but then there's all these edge cases that you have to spend months trying to fight with your SageMaker to actually get what you want out of it. Okay, well, this is, this is exactly the use case on, okay, now you understand the problem. You understand this is where building your platform you, you have an actual reason to build your platform. It, become, it becomes sustainable. You say, hey, if we really need this from the business perspective, I mean, we are dealing with data. Why not dealing with financial data? You know how much it's going to cost to run those things. You know how much it's going to cost not to do it. Uh, and, and so you, you, it's, more to, it's better to have those uh, data-informed decisions, data-driven decisions, than actually just wing it and say, hey, you know what, today I feel like you know, everybody on Slack uh, that day make a decision about building a platform. This is terrible. It's undocumented. It's un, like uh, you cannot justify it. And not even for others, just for you in six months when you, somebody will ask, you say, why did you do that? You know, document your architectural decision. This is very, very important. It's, it's, it doesn't take a lot. It's just like one page. Hey, we find this problem. This is what we had. This is how we, we think of solving it. Maybe we we wrong. Please forgive us. That's that's how I would I would write it. Like assume you're gonna be wrong, and, and plan. It's like a chaos engineering mindset. Assume something will go wrong and, and plan for it. And if you're if you're okay with the risk, then it's all good. You, you're not gonna stress about it. And this is where it's the, the relationship we have with the unknown, and we can very much minimize that. So, so that question is great because that means, yes, you have a use case for building a platform or maybe a part of a platform or the, the part that's missing from the cloud. And if you have that problem, probably other company have. So that's a great open source op opportunity to collaborate. Uh, and, and you see, you build that community out of that. Uh, and it, it might even become a startup product at some point because the cloud didn't, cannot manage to evolve as quick as startup. They, it evolved very quick, but they have to, they have a different skill, you know, what, once they have to change something, it's like millions of users. So it's not the same as, hey, we're going to start small with, a, you know, 10 users and see how it feels. And probably there is a market for that and, and those kind of things. So, so having a, this uh, need driven uh, development is actually much, much better, easier to justify, I would say. And it's all the, the concept about, yeah, people were, were chanting about multi-cloud. And I think they, they misunderstood because the, the real locking of the cloud is security. Because, you know, CPU will run, right? It's a CPU, RAM, networking, it's, the, it's more or less the same. But security, every cloud has their own security model and mm -hmm. different level of granularity that don't translate very well. And that's really hard to, like, most projects got killed because of that. However, multi-cloud makes sense when you have your people negotiate, negotiate the contract for renewal with the cloud provider and say, hey, we are on two cloud. If you don't give us a good discount, we're going there. And that's, that's how it works. Like, it's not at all about technology. It's about leverage. So multi-cloud is very much about having that discount with cloud providers. And it's not about reliability. That's what I mean, because it's way, way harder 
to to have those to, to manage those two clouds. And when people migrate, is actually uh, you know the, so some project never migrate. They just let it die and they rebuild something into the new cloud because it's just impossible to reverse engineer everything that has been done or translate it while maintain. It's like changing an airplane, changing the engine of an airplane while you're flying. It's just right. really really hard those things. So th there is many things like that that. It's very much uh, using your wisdom and seeing the landscape that you're in about that and strategize according to that. There is a great, uh, great talk by uh, Simon Wardley. Okay. It's called uh, Crossing the River by Filling the Stones. And it, it talks all about strategy and how, you know, how you can plan years in advance. Like, okay, many companies have, to have that problem. So... Uh, um, you know, solution will came by that time and you can actually plan for future, you know, what you should build and buy. And this is why like start, start with the cloud because you, you don't know even if your product is going to make it or not, uh, or, or you, you might have to pivot at some point and you will, it's easier to, you know, all that infrastructure part to outsource that to a, a cloud provider that you pay rather than trying to compete with it, with people that you're going to hire and train uh, that have to maintain all that infrastructure. So it, it, it's it's about Amazing. strategy. It's, it's, yeah. te it's That's why I say te tech is actually not really a problem for me. It's, it's a fun problem to have, I would say. I'm really happy when I have a tech problem. That like, makes my day, you know. I, I love that. But, and also, if you ask developer, you know, okay, don't ask the barber if you need a haircut. If you yeah. ask yeah. a developer what's the problem, he's going to come up with a code solution, you know, more code, right. more tests, more deployment, more manifest, more everything. So, you know, it's important to ask, like, what's the right level of abstraction we should apply the solution to? Sometimes changing a process solve, you know, months of development. Say, are we going right. to need that really? If we change that process, we can actually save you know, we don't need to build this. Or if we actually yeah. keep something very simple, like everything into one folder, I, I just take example like that. But you see, like keeping things simple is actually a full-time job and it takes a lot of meetings. I totally see your point across your answer there, right? Which is this experience and the, the trying to make the complex simple um, and, and how you can find ways to do that iteratively is the essence of modern sort of software engineering in practice, right? And I think that that is a really great takeaway for us to wrap up on. Unfortunately, we're, we're at time and uh, Julian, it has been a pleasure to have you on. I, it's been a while since I've laughed as much as I have on a, on a podcast and, and also learned yes, a lot at the brilliant. same time. So thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I had a blast. <laughs>